Good afternoon and welcome. And welcome to our friends who are joining us on Zoom. The issues we're going to be talking about this afternoon go well beyond Harrogate, well beyond this area. We're talking about a global issue. So it's good that we're joined by people further away as well as those who are here in the room. I'm Martin Schweiger. Anything that goes wrong this afternoon, blame me. <laughs> what will go well is what our invited speakers and what you do. Because at the end of the day, the whole lot, one of the messages, it's not what other people are doing, it's what are we doing. And it's very important. So, welcome to Harrogate meeting. I'm not a member of this meeting, I'm actually a member of Roundhay meeting in Leeds, but Quakers can cross borders as well. So, but welcome to people who are not part of the Society of Friends, but are concerned about all the issues about peace, security, and insecurity, and what's happening with defence and surveillance, all of these issues linked together. So it's really good that we can come into this space that is used on a regular basis for people to sit quietly and listen and try and discern the appropriate insights. What is it that we're called upon to do? How do we actually make our lives speak in a way that says things matter? And we're going to be focusing this afternoon on what's happening at Menworth Hill not that far away from us and we need to be asking ourselves what do we know about what's happening there and that's the focus of this afternoon it's bringing us up to date since the last report was done lifting the lid and now the men with hill accountability campaign and yorkshire cnd with the help from joseph roundtree trust have been able to commission barnaby who i'm you know the, the relief when you see the key individual who can actually guide us through this, the next part, that he's actually in the room, he's here with us, and he's going to share with us. So that will be good. So thanks very much everyone for coming. It's taken us a few minutes to get started, but hopefully we're all doing everything as a little bit experimental. I haven't tried, I don't think I've tried to use this setup before, and one of the experiments is going to be asking you to gently shuffle as best we can to see the screen so that you can see the film. But if you can't see the film, you'll be able to hear it. And worry not, we're going to make sure a copy of that film is going to go onto the Men With Hill Accountability campaign website so you can look at it repeatedly. As long as the internet exists, you'll be able to come back and revisit this afternoon and say, was my recollection correct? Did they really say that? And one of the important things to do is not to walk out of this room. I hope nobody will think of walking out of this room without a copy of the report clutched closely to your heart and then later in front of your eyes so that you can read it. Because whatever is said this afternoon, we know that most, most people can remember just a few facts from anything that is said. So you'll forget everything I've said now, but I hope you'll remember, read the report and think about it. And there's the copies of the report are at the door on the way back. Some of you have already been able to get one as you came in. Great. And if you want to bring one for a friend, I'm sure we've got enough copies for you to do that. So this report is not a gold dust report. You are allowed to share it and encourage others to read it. The, so the, basically, the report was written because it's some years since the previous report on Menworth Hill was put together. That was published under the title of Lifting the Lid, and it's still available online. For, I think the CND website has got it, and I think we've got a link to it on the Men With Hill Accountability Campaign website. Read it, well worth reading. 
but probably more important is to read the up-to-date report, which is available from 3 o'clock this afternoon. The embargoes for the press have been lifted. Good chance to be able to read it now. We, the report was commissioned because we realised time has passed. What was written before, hopefully it was valid at the time, but as time goes on, also people change, the processes change, the equipment changes, and the implications also begin to change. And if we're expressing concern or even just straightforward interest, it's good to be aware of those changes. And what does it mean on a wet Saturday in October 2021? What does it mean today? So this is highly relevant. Do read it. Now you've probably heard more than enough from me and I'm going to hand over to Barnaby Pace, who's got an impressive track record of research, which I'm sure he can tell you more about over the cup of tea later, but I think we really want to hear you talking about the report. So if I can hand over sure. to Barnaby and uh, thank him for taking the trouble to come up north and talk to us. <laughs> Thanks very much, Barnaby. Um, hi, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me and, and so lovely to pe see people in reality in, in person, which is, as Martin says, has been a, a novelty in this project and certainly a novelty for me for the last two years. Um, I've taken off my mask. I am vaccinated and all the rest. If anyone's uncomfortable about that, please tell me now. Um, but it's an effort that people can hear me. If you can't hear me, also please put up your hand. Um, I don't know the acoustics, etc. So, as Martin says, we are talking about Menworth Hill, and Menworth Hill and our understanding of the base has changed significantly over, over the last decade. The biggest event being the Snowden leaks uh, starting in 2013. That has radically really changed our understanding of what happens there. And the top line is that Menworth Hill is a linchpin in the drone assassination campaigns that have killed thousands of people. The base is a central piece in a vast system of surveillance. The accountability for what happens there and at other similar bases in the UK seems to be severely limited. And Menworth Hill continues to be part of a missile defence system that is intrinsically linked to the potential for nuclear conflicts and other types of conflicts as well. So I thought I'd start with this statistic, which I found quite striking. According to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, who maintains a database on the subject, between 8,858 and 16,900 people were killed in US drone strikes between 2010 and 2020. Of though, that number, up to 2,200 were estimated to be civilians, and there were estimated to be between 283 and 454 children among the victims of those strikes. By another measure, I should say, uh, another study done by Reprieve, the human rights group, back in 2014, looked at the quote-unquote targeted killings, the attempted killings of 41 individual men. Uh, I should say at the start, I'm going to use the phrase targeted killings. There's a widespread and, I would say, very valid criticism that that's a euphemism for assassination, an assassination campaign. Um, Reprieve found that in targeting those 41 men, 1,147 people were killed. That's a rate of 28 people killed for every one person that was actually targeted. So this is to start by saying that drone warfare and modern military tactics are anything but precise, are anything but surgical, whatever uh, PR has been put out over the years. And we'll get to how this is relevant to Men With Hill and directly relevant to this local area. So I'll start by explaining a bit more about drone strikes and what they are and who does them. So um, US drone strikes are not carried out only by the US military. They're carried out by the CIA and the Joint Special Forces Command, which comes out of the Pentagon. There are many strikes we know in war zones like Iraq and Afghanistan in recent years, but also in areas that uh, are not current war zones, or at least not ones that the US or, or the UK involved in. Yemen, Pakistan, Somalia have had hundreds of drone strikes. The justification is that there's a right of self-defense against a real and imminent threat. Um, 
or alternatively, that these strikes are part of a global battlefield theory under the uh, war on terror. And so anyone associated with uh, a designated group uh, or, an, or an individual, Al-Qaeda being a good example, was deemed open to being um, assassinated under the US drone strategy. What we know is that um, strikes under Obama significantly increased, and we found out the grisly details of it that President Obama every Tuesday was presented with the profiles of potential targets in an event they dubbed Terror Tuesdays. And we know that under uh, President Trump, some of the restrictions that Obama had put in place, albeit while strikes increased, were rolled back. And that authority to order the assassination of people around the world was delegated to military officials, to intelligence agencies. This is not limited to the US. The UK began using drone strikes in 2015 to strike, uh, to assassinate people, including British citizens, British citizens overseas. In 2015, David Cameron told Parliament about this, saying this was a new departure for Britain and described how uh, the RAF had used a drone in Syria to uh, assassinate uh, a member of Islamic State, a British citizen called Riyad Khan. We also know that, um, according to the Attorney General, uh, then Jeremy Wright in 2017, that the UK did not need any quote-unquote specific intelligence of any imminent threat to do one of these strikes. Um, that uh, they could strike preemptively without a detailed idea that there was an imminent threat. And we also know that Boris Johnson wrote in 2018 in The Spectator that the motivation for a strike could not just be in self-defense, but he said it could be as payback or revenge, which is obviously deeply concerning. And to go quickly to the legality of this, the Joint Committee on Human Rights in Parliament looked into the UK's lethal drone strike policy in 2016, and they said there was considerable doubt of, over whether what they, the UK personnel, are being asked to do is lawful, and therefore these strikes may expose them and ministers to the risk of prosecution for the murder or complicity in murder. So it's worth saying that the legality of these policies are deeply contested still, not to mention the ethics and morality. Now how does this relate to Menwith Hill? Menwith Hill, there aren't drones flying out of it. And this quite, I, th I think, sums up that connection quite neatly. This is a quote from a former US drone op operator who gave an interview to The Intercept uh, in 2017. Uh, I should say The Intercept's a publication that delved deeply into the Snowden uh, leaks. And they said, it's really like we're targeting a cell phone. We're not going after people, we're going after their phones in the hopes that the person on the other end of that missile is the bad guy. And this is a, a strategy that's been confirmed by other senior officials. Uh, the former CIA and NSA director, Michael Hayden, uh, said publicly in 2014 that we target pe people based on metadata. Now, I'll explain what metadata is and how that's related to Men With Hill in a moment. But to put it simply, Men With Hill is a massive spy base. It's the largest known overseas uh, base for the NSA, the National Security Agency, anywhere in the world, and it monitors communications globally. Documents from uh, the Snowden leaks told us that Menworth Hill alone is capable of recording 335 million metadata records in a day. Now, a metadata record isn't necessarily the entire voice recording of your phone call. It might uh, be simply the phone number you rang from, the phone number you, wrote, you were calling, the date, the time, the IP address you logged onto the internet with uh, small bits of information. But even then, you can see the vast quantity of information. And to go back to the previous slide, US officials confirmed that they will target people, places, based purely on that information. If the IP address of a computer matches the, the, their suspected suspect, they feel justified in attempting to attack that site with a missile or a bomb or whatever it may be. In addition to monitoring global communications, phone call, text messages, uh, we also know that Menworth Hill was involved in what was described in the papers as industrial scale exploitation of computer systems and networks. 
and that Menwith Hill played a significant role, as did GCHQ more widely, in the hacking into of some of the biggest internet tech company systems in the world. They had access at one point at least to nine of the world's biggest internet company systems, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, Yahoo, Skype, pretty much anything you can think of they probably had access to. And the scale of this is vast, and the potential utility of it is vast. To give one example, one program exposed by the Snowden leaks showed that the NSA was recording 200 million text messages a day. From that database that they were collecting, they could search for addresses, they could search for contact details, they could search for what uh, appointments people might had, have, and then from these email databases, you could track down information that these internet companies assured us as consumers would be kept protected, whether that's our personal communications, our banking data, our medical details. In addition, the thing that we probably all know about Menneth Hill, and certainly is, is there on the front cover, is the big golf ball radomes. Those radomes, those golf balls, little structures cover satellite dishes. Um, and those, those have been used for spying through satellites for decades at this point. The key, the, the different uses of that, um, so for example, US satellites are used to track Wi-Fi signals and mobile phone connections around the world. Or in another program, um, the NSA files showed that at one single time, 163 different satellites were being eavesdropped on so that Menwith Hill could listen into communications around the world. Now, one key element here, and one of the reasons that Menwith Hill is so connected to conflict, is that we're kind of used to the idea that we have phone, physical phone lines and fiber optic connections and all these kinds of things. But a lot of the world relies on satellite communication, satellite phones or or systems that end up going via satellite aid regardless, particularly Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And so this makes Menel Hill incredibly important for monitoring in those regions. And to give, again, a sense of the scale, this was a quote from 2008. Keith Alexander, who was then the NSA director, recorded in some of the documents in the Snowden leaks. Mm -hmm. And he was quoted as saying, why can't we collect all the signals all the time? sounds like a good summer homework project for Menlith. And we know that the net is cast incredibly widely, and this sweeps up vast amounts of data that has nothing to do with uh, the original purpose, whether that be uh, justified on counterterrorism, on um, organized crime, or whatever it may, may be. The Washington Post did an analysis of NSA documents, and they found that 90% of the intercepted conversations that they saw in their sample were not with people who were targeted. They were just ordinary people caught up in the net. I, and to add to that, the Snowden leaks also revealed that the surveillance capabilities were not just used on uh, in war zones, on suspected terrorists or criminals. They were used on friendly world leaders. There was a massive scandal around the NSA tapping Angela Merkel's phone, including using British bases to do that. GCHQ was found to have tried to hack into the email of the then Israeli Prime Minister, Olmert, and there was evidence that they'd hacked into the details of aid agencies, UN agencies, EU politicians, um, and clearly the scope of this goes far beyond if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. This is affecting everyone and just a, a vast panopticon of surveillance. And this brings us back to the drone strikes. So drone strikes happen because the, the intelligence is there to say where to send the drone and where to send the missile. And the documents exposed by Edward Snowden and the journalists who've worked diligently over years to, to piece them together, as well as other sources, um, specifically name Menwith Hill as the source for lethal drone strikes and, and other lethal operations. One program, and I've avoided giving the code names because it makes it sound too James Bond and the code names get confusing because they're meant to be confusing. But in the context of this quote, uh, I'm afraid I have to include it, this program called Ghost Hunter they're talking about. Success of the Ghost Hunter prototype developed at Menworth Hill Station, a tool that enabled significant number of capture kill operations against terrorists. And they named specific operations against Al Qaeda, linked people in Lebanon and Iraq, describing in Iraq, for example, how this person had logged into an internet cafe, Menwith Hill had supplied satellite data, and they'd sent the targeting information to military uh, commanders on the ground, using language that suggested that they were going to go and kill this person. 
Um, and then, in addition, I should say this is not limited purely to war zones like this. This is linked to places like Yemen. So another program in the NSA files uh, described how men was, was part of a program to monitor Yemeni internet cafes. Again, a theme. And this program aimed to, quote, capture or eliminate suspected terrorists in Yemen. Now, we don't have all the details, and it's worth noting that while we know so much more about Menworth Hill than we did 10 years ago, we've got a snapshot, because the Snowden leaks happened in 2013, and we don't really know what's happened since. But what we do know is that these strikes have consequences. So we know that US drone strikes in Yemen during the Trump administration killed at least 86 civilians, including 28 children. That's according to the casualty tracking group Air Wars. And we also know that it's implicated, and these strikes are implicated in the potential for much wider conflict. So many of you will have seen on the news a year ago, and may recall the, the assassination of an Iranian really official called Qasem Soleimani, who was killed with a drone strike on the orders of Donald Trump when he was visiting Baghdad. And this led to uh, an escalation where Iranian missiles were fired at US forces uh, in Iraq. And there was a genuine moment of fear that it could really escalate into something much more serious. Obviously, it was illegal. There were, there were strong criticisms under US law, international law, Iraqi law, that this, this strike violated all of those. Um, but it could have been much worse than it was. And the role of drone strikes is integral to that. We don't know if Menwith Hill was involved in that strike, but we know that questions are right to be asked, and we haven't gotten answers. Alex Sobel, the Leeds MP, asked this question in Parliament and didn't get a good answer, I should say. So moving on to legal accountability. So in general, there's a, a legal precedent in the UK, it's called the Bell Hodge case, that UK government officials can be account, found accountable for their role in wrongdoing by other states. Bell Hodge, you may recall, was the case where a Libyan man was uh, part of a rendition back to Libya where he and his family were tortured and UK officials were found to have cooperated and facilitated that rendition. And after many years in court, the UK government was found to be culpable. Specific to surveillance programs, both the UK and the US surveillance systems since the Snowden leaks have been found to be running illegally. Um, in 2015, the IPT, the IPT is the Investigatory Powers Tribunal. It's a specific court set up in the UK that's very secretive, that oversees intelligence agencies. It, their rulings, uh, their, their hearings are heard in private. Not even the complainant are allowed in the room. Their lawyers are, but the complainants are. This case brought by civil liberties groups and human rights groups found that the US, UK intelligence sharing arrangement had been illegal because it had been secret. The irony is that due to the publicity around the court case and the Snowden leaks, the court found that actually it was now legal, even though we you know the bare minimum of that arrangement. In 2018, similarly, this court ruled that GCHQ had been illegally given unfettered authority to collect personal customer information from telecoms companies. Again, a wide uh, sweeping finding of, of wrongdoing here. And I should say these are very unusual. Before 2015, um, that ruling was the first time the IPT had ever ruled against the government. And I think it had existed for about 15 or 20 years. So this is highly unusual even then. And then there's another case. In 2018, the European Court of Human Rights similarly found that there was a lack of oversight for the illegal bulk wiretapping that the UK was engaged in. And I should mention, if, if briefly, that the case of Harry Dunn, the, the young motorcyclist who was, who was killed in an accident outside a US uh, base, a, a UK base, staffed by US uh, officers, including intelligence agents. And Anna Sekoulis, the lady who, by her own admission, was driving on the wrong side of the road and, and hit Harry Dunn, fled the country claiming diplomatic immunity. And this has lifted the lid on what kind of accountability there is, even on you know, the small stuff, as it were. Obviously, it's not small to Harry Dunn, but we're not talking about international law and crimes overseas, but just who's responsible for a, for a road traffic accident. And I think it's worth asking the question of what, what accountability there really is. To move on, there's also the potential of parliamentary accountability, obviously. We've relied for legal accountability on the leaks and the very hard work of human rights groups and civil liberties groups to go to court to fight for years, often at their own cost. 
to try and, and see whether these things were legal or not. In theory, Parliament should be doing this job all the time. But we know that Parliament has not been allowed to do their job properly. Chris Hume, uh, the former Liberal Democrat minister, who was a minister under the uh, coalition government, sat on the National Security Council, and after uh, the Snowden leaks came out, he said he was unaware of many of the capabilities that were revealed. Some of the big programs around hacking and phone tapping, he said he did not know about, even as he was being lobbied by intelligence agencies to uh, change the law and enable them to do the hacking that they were already doing that he didn't know about. In theory, there's a parliamentary committee, the Intelligence and Security Committee, that has oversight over the intelligence agencies, but it's not like the other parliamentary committees. Uh, members are nominated by the Prime Minister in consultation with other parties, unlike how normal members are elected in, in public. Hearings are nearly always private, and their reports are usually heavily vetted. The people nominated are usually from security backgrounds, and so are generally very deferential, or certainly is a risk of this to security agencies. And we know there's a serious risk of politicization. Last year, the Russia report, um, you may recall the scandal around it, that in t ahead of the 2019 election, this report wasn't being released. And then the government didn't reconstitute this parliamentary committee for nine months after the election. And even then, the government tried to install Chris Grayling, uh, a minister known for his great and many achievements, um, in as the leader of this committee uh, against the wishes of virtually everyone else, and it took a Conservative MP, Julian Lewis, to his great credit, rebelling and putting himself forward as a candidate to take over that committee, supported by the opposition members, an act that got him expelled from the Conservative Party for doing this. And that was the only thing that led to the Russia report coming out in the end. So we know this committee can be politicised and isn't always enabled to do their job properly. And I'll come to one last section. So this is a quote from uh, a military officer at RAF Filingdales near here, the radar base, who said, if we were a target, we would have already completed our mission. So our mission would already have been done. That's the mindset of the people who work here. The mes mission he's talking about is part of the US ballistic missile defense system that uh, bases like Filingdales and Menworth Hill are part of. Filingdales is a radar base. Menworth Hill has satellite communications and monitoring, right? Missile defense is a controversial subject. It's been wildly expensive, deeply unreliable by virtually all independent tests, and yet has solidified itself in the public mind of people who think about nuclear conflict. President Trump said while in office during the North Korea crisis that the US had missiles that could knock out a missile in the air 90%, 7% of the time. Now, I'm not particularly relying on former President Trump to be the arbiter of truth and, and justice in this matter, and he may be exaggerating, because that happened. Um, but if he genuinely believed this, then he had an entirely false idea of US security. These missiles uh, work often, in some cases, a small percentage of the time, and can be easily defeated by countermeasures and decoys that nuclear armed states have. This means that if a country thinks, I can make a mis uh, launch a missile uh, and start a conflict immune from retaliation. The criticism is that this could make nuclear conflict more likely. The quote from that military officer is, yeah, and, and if it happens, uh, Yorkshire is at risk. We might die from it, but at least we'll have done our job and warned someone else. That may not even have happened, but certainly it puts into context the role of Yorkshire and the risks of living at these military bases. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but to summarise, Menworth Hill, we now know, is at the centre of a vast surveillance system, bigger than we'd ever appreciated before the Snowden leaks. It's key to drone strikes. The intelligence it gathers fuels those dry strikes and makes it possible. It's part of a missile defense system that's intrinsically linked to nuclear war, and the base is largely operating unaccountably. There's no sustained parliamentary accountability, and legal accountability is barely possible and only because of leaks. This base should be really alarming, and the very existence of it should be alarming to, to people who, who live in the UK and in Yorkshire particularly. I hope this has opened your eyes and shown in what is actually happening here, and I look forward to us having a discussion of it in a little while. Thank you very much.
This is Menworth Hill Spy Base. It's being used by the US and on occasion by the UK for three specific uh, activities. One is the surveillance of um, electronic communications, all forms of electronic communications through satellite technology and interception. Uh, the other form is uh, for a missile defence. It's part of the US missile defence system which can be used um, to uh, prevent retaliation from a nuclear first strike uh, and also used for giving information for drone strikes. Uh, illegal drone strikes. The Menmouth Hill Accountability Campaign is a small group which started about five or six years ago and it takes over the action against the base, the idea of trying to make it accountable from a long history of groups which have come up here and taken actions, processions, demonstrations and this campaign started more or less in the 1980s Menmouth Hill Accountability Campaign does various things, so it organises demonstrations, it has a website, it organises newsletters and publications, and last year it was fortunate enough to get a grant to produce a report about the base. The base has had things written about it before, but the latest one was in 2012, and since that time there have been a lot of uh, changes taken place, especially in the area of IT. So it's been nearly 10 years since anyone really delved deeply into what's happening at Menworth Hill and the public understanding of what's been going on there has rapidly changed, especially since the 2013 leaks by Edward Snowden and a lot of exposés by investigative journalists relying on Snowden's uh, leaks, other exposés and there have been other things like court cases since that really shine a light on what's been happening at the base and allow us to understand the nature of the programmes there in a level of detail we've never been able to achieve before. Every dome or ray dome contains a satellite dish and those dishes are receiving information from satellites which are circling the earth. Each golf ball is actually made of polyurethane foam and that foam has two purposes. It stops weather getting at the satellite dishes and damaging them and it also prevents people from outside the base being able to see which direction the satellite dishes are facing and, and from that information could be gathered as to which satellite was being used radomes are still being built because the purpose of the base has changed slightly over the years. It went from intelligence gathering to missile defence, for example, and now to the use of, of drones. Memeth is one of a number of stations which is a global system for surveillance and uh, monitoring of various information technologies. The data that's collected here is being used by the security agencies of the United States and of the United Kingdom and it's used to track uh, individuals and groups that they believe may be some kind of a threat or they are interested in for some reason or another and also um, it has been used to uh, target specific individuals such as politicians, uh, those kind of people who may be of some concern to the governments of either of the UK or of the US. These are illegal activities which shouldn't take place. Other illegal activities such as, such as tapping people's telephones, uh, messages, uh, without getting the required warrants have also occurred too and also we don't know what information they're collecting we don't know what kinds of information we know they're capable of collecting all sorts of information we don't know exactly what they're collecting uh, and we don't know really what happens to it afterwards so it's very unaccountable the unaccountability of this base is paramount and it must really be challenged what concerns many campaigners is that they also track, or they can also track, the movements and activities of individuals and groups who are actively trying to protest and demonstrate about the um, presence of some of the US bases in the UK. The association of this base and the drones, which are frequently killing people in countries far away, whether it's the Yemen or Afghanistan, Somalia, these drones are operated on the basis of information collected right here behind me at Menworth Hill. We've got 
an increasing amount of evidence that the drones are targeted. Some of it comes from information that has been uh, released from the Pentagon and in papers which are available online, papers which have been quoted in the report, we are pretty confident that drones are now increasingly targeted by metadata, by the information data that's collected from all, all sorts of places, pulled together, and the assumption is this is the person that we really want to get at, and the drones are then targeted onto that person. What's wrong with the use of drones? There's a lot wrong with it. One of the top things is that if we sent armed aeroplanes, planes that are piloted by a human being, Parliament has to know about it. We couldn't send troops into Iraq without Parliament discussing it. We can send un unmanned drones into countries anywhere in the world without any reference, without any accountability. Drones are taking warfare into a new dimension. We're told that this base makes us more secure because it can, it can monitor terrorists and it can look at what our, our so-called enemies are, are doing. In actual fact, it makes us less secure because it's a target itself. And it's a target for anybody who wants to get at American activities that are carried out here, the spying activities, uh, uh, and so on, and, it, and the missile defense activities. It realize, people will realize that this is a first base for the United States in any time of war. So it makes us less secure, not more secure. The base has become much more security conscious, security in, in, the, in the way that they don't want people inside the base. So in order to make the base more secure, they put on these big uh, security gates, they put barbed wire around and they have cameras to uh, spot anybody that's anywhere near the vicinity of the base and regular patrols of the police as well. They try to make the base look as intimidating as possible to put people off of um, trying to ask questions or to get anywhere near it. Uh, so this tree here, for example, which was planted in memory of Bob Cryer, who's an MP who asked questions, uh, difficult questions in Parliament about the activities on this base, but unfortunately he was killed in a car accident. It was planted in his name and it's now in danger of being destroyed or supposedly moved because they want to make this a much grander entrance to the base. If people want to read the report, we'd say, great, this report is really worth reading. We'll tell you how to get hold of a copy on our website. We'd be delighted to make sure you get a copy, either online or on paper. Read it, engage your brain, think about it, and then decide what, not what other people should do, but what do you do. We've all got a responsibility here. These drones, you and I are paying for them. You and I have to take some responsibility for the fact they exist and are being used to carry out extrajudicial executions on a regular basis. We've been able to rely substantially on some of the original documents from within the NSA and GCHQ and reporting done by a lot of reputable news outlets based on those documents. Uh, investigative journalists have really dug deeply into leaks that have come out and whistleblowers, Edward Snowden, but others as well. And on top of those, NGOs, human rights groups, civil liberties groups have also been taking legal cases over some of these revelations and more still has come out in court. In the very last part of the video, you can read at the back of the report, it's really the three demands from CND and the Men With Hill Accountability campaign. That, uh, well, you can read it for yourself, but it's essentially saying there should be accountability, it should comply with the law, and that anything that's illegal, we should just stop. Um, I don't know if that's a good point now to hand over to David to, to uh, take us through the CMA perspective. 
Thanks very much, <coughs> and um, thanks to Barnaby for putting such an amazing report together. Um, uh, you will have <coughs> gathered the impression that secrecy is pretty uh, important in this particular topic, and in fact the NSA, which was established in the 1950s by President Truman, was actually secret for many years. It was never discussed, never openly uh, disclosed. And in fact, many people, after it was disclosed, called it the no such agency, the NSA no such agency. Um, and uh, I think we should also thank, as Barnaby did at the end there, the, the whistleblowers who brought a lot of the um, information to our attention, especially Edward Snowden, of course, who is now in exile in Russia because of his disclosures. Uh, but also, you, you may remember Catherine Gunn, who was working for the GCHQ, and she came across, um, it, like all of these whistleblowers, they come across incidents where they think, something is wrong here, we shouldn't be doing this, we shouldn't be spying on whoever we're spying on. And Catherine Gunn found um, information that uh, the NSA, GCHQ, were actually spying on the United Nations itself. And, and, bringing, and she brought that to the attention of the British public and the public elsewhere. And uh, threat, you know, she, was, she could have, um, she, she didn't, but she could have uh, uh, had a prison term for what she was um, disclosing. But she had a conscience. And many of the people that work in, in places like Menwith Hill do have a conscience. And they do in, end up speaking out against what they have been working for for quite some time. So I think we should thank those people. Um, what interested CND in the first instance in, in um, Mammoth Hill was partly the secrecy, I guess. But we also had a visit <coughs> some years ago now, I can't even remember what year it was, from a group of uh, campaigners in the United States who came across to tell us. They came from um, Colorado Springs, which is like the, the heart of the US space systems and is now part of the US uh, Space Force uh, and they came because they, they knew about the kind of extent of the US bases around the world and they knew exactly how important Menworth Hill was to that huge surveillance setup and they told us some of the information there so from that kind of information we found out that uh, Menworth Hill was the principal NATO theatre ground segment for high altitude intelligence satellites. Uh, so there's a military, a direct military collection, connection between Menworth Hill and NATO and some of the military activities. We didn't know exactly what, we still don't really know all the information there is to know, but we knew there was a military connection. And of course then in 1996, I think it was when CAB found out that uh, Memoth Hill was going to be the ground relay station for the, the um, satellite-based system for missile defence, then there was that, kind of, that kind of connection was really important for CND because uh, we are campaigning against um, missile defence, against the US Star Wars systems, because of what was said again in the film and in the report that it, although it sold missile defence is sold as a defensive system. In fact, it can be seen, and the United States itself considers it part of uh, its possible first strike nuclear um, system. So it would prevent, or try to prevent anyway, any retaliation from a much depleted first, first strike. Um, so uh, there are so, so many important things that are going on in Memworth Hill or around Menworth Hill, as I say, it's part of this huge global system that um, is composed of many bases similar to, Mem to Menworth and, uh, and um, around the world. In fact, this today is the first day of Keep Space for Peace Week, which is an international campaign about all of these different bases and the uh, militarization and weaponization of space and um, each, each October, the United Nations specified the first week of October to be Space Week, and the campaigners around the world took that on and, and have also renamed it Keep Space for Peace Week for our purposes. 
So today is the first day of that week. There'll be a number of activities going on. We can't go to, normally people would go to the bases themselves and protest and demonstrate, show placards, etc. Uh, since COVID, that hasn't been quite so possible, but there are a number of webinars on, um, available to give information out to people to discuss the particular problems of militarization of space. So please look on the Yorkshire CND website or on uh, wwwspace 4 peace for <coughs> number 4 peaceorg uh, they'll give you all the information about the various activities that are going on. Um, again, I want to thank Barnaby for putting this together really well. The report that CND commissioned in 2012 was uh, also extremely useful, but that happened a year before um, uh, Edward Snowden gave his revelations. And uh, since then, there's been so much more coming out as well. And I think Barnaby's done a brilliant job of bringing all of those different activities at Men With Hill on the repercussions and the possible consequences of the work that goes on there, bringing it all together in one report. And uh, thanks to him and thanks to um, Men With Hill Accountability Campaign for their continued work and their continued attempts to draw attention to Men With Hill. It's so important that more people know about what goes on there uh, and have a, have a say in what happens. So, thanks very much and thanks Barnaby. Thanks. David, would you like to stay at the front? And this is now the opportunity for you to say you've seen and you've heard and would you like to either make comments or, or questions and that includes our friends who are online. Uh, if you'd like to come in, as long as we can make sure we, we can hear you. Uh, who would like to start us off? As if we go, we'll start off in the room at the front, and then we'll go online, and then we'll come back into the room. Okay, can you hear me from here? Is it, or should I go to a microphone? I think it's probably better you come here, and then we'll go to Linda's after that. No, I just want to say, Martin, that actually, um, I was going to say something on behalf of the Men with Hill, going to build. Oh, right. Okay. This won't take long. Uh, I just wanted to say on behalf of the campaign how great it is to see so many of you here today and to thank everybody who's already spoken and taken part, um, especially Martin, whose idea it was to apply for a grant to get this report done. I'd like to say how grateful we are to the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust for having the confidence in our small group um, with the support of YCND um, to, to go ahead, to give us the grant so that we were actually able to do this because it will be a wonderful resource for us. That our motivation was basically that we realised that stuff that we had was out of date. Uh, therefore, you can't be confident in your campaigning if, you, if you're not on firm ground, if you don't know exactly what you're saying. So that's the very important thing. Joseph Rowntree Charitable Trust do not uh, send comment on the content of a report, um, but they have sent their very best wishes for the launch and, and apologies for not being here in person. Uh, to meet any of you. I would like to point out that the copies that we're giving out today do contain the name of the JRCT on the front. Um, future copies, if we have a reprint, will not have this on the front. It's just because there is a disclaimer at the back which has to appear to say that they are not associated with the content of the report and we didn't realise that that should actually have gone on the front as well if we were going to put their name there. Before I finish, I'd like to, to do two things. One is to credit all the people who've campaigned at um, Men With Hill before. So immediately, Campaign for the Accountability of American Bases and Lindis sitting at the back there comes to mind as somebody who has worked tirelessly in this campaign. And then before her, uh, the Women's Peace Camp, the Mixed Peace Camp, Otley Peace Action Group, of which I was a, a founder member. Um, so things have been going on for a long time and it's a shame that um, somehow the NSA are always one step ahead, I guess. Not sure whether that's the right way of putting it, but there's always more to do. 
I'd like to mention the people who would like to have been here today and are unable to attend due to ill health, like Annie Rainbow, who worked on the Campaign for Accountability of American Bases with Lindis, like Christine and Dean and Paul Wood from Ockley, and Anne Lee, who was also a tireless campaigner and indeed is still working and would be here, but unfortunately she's very deaf and can't take part in meetings anymore. So I think that's all I need to say thank you, except I think that it's, the report will be very, very useful. It's information, it's inspiration to all of us for the future. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Hazel. I forgot, I was meant to say right at the beginning, we also have love sent from Martin Wainwright, who on uh, at least one November, oh, July the 4th event, spoke very well up at Menworth and has continued to take an active interest. He used to write for The Guardian, uh, but we saw him this morning and he sends his, all his love to everybody here and those who are joining us on Zoom. Okay. Now, if you had a question to get us going. I think, I think Lindis was telling me that I'm getting out of step and that I should have gone to Hazel first. So, Colin, do you want to start us off? Okay, shall I come up to this microphone here? Is that I, think this, I think you have to speak here to... Speak here, uh, yeah. So many uh, systems at work. It's all very high tech, this, isn't it? <laughs> very appropriate. Well, first of all, congratulations and thanks for these excellent presentations and all of this work that's gone in over the years. I've followed it in some ways from a distance, but um, my, my concern is, you know, you said there might be one step ahead of us, or several steps ahead of us. Um, my concern is the next 10 years. In, in some ways, this report is a little bit of a retrospective over the period when the war on terror was the, the major political dominant strategy and so on. Obviously, uh, missile defense is another dimension. My concern is about China and Russia and the US and all of the new agenda that Biden is clearly pushing forward, uh, wanting to move on from the Obama years and the Trump years. I suspect that the issue of particularly Islamic terrorism is not going to go away. And that, you know, the, the more they do, the more they stimulate the, uh, the people that, that hate America. And so they'll need to keep doing these wretched drone assassinations. But it feels from the discourse, and you look at the moves around Taiwan and sending our aircraft carriers there and so on, that that this double Cold War is what we're now in. It's Russia and China simultaneously for different reasons. It's about who's, who's dominant in the world and the US feels threatened. So my question is, have you dug up anything about what's coming, the new role of the military and the space wars and so on, uh, that are where Menwith is deeply embedded? It may be difficult to find that out and to distinguish it from its other roles but I think that's the agenda we're going to have to face in the coming decade. So just be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Um, so it's a really good question, and, and as we've you know, caveated extensively, like we only ever find out about this stuff in the rearview mirror nearly all the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, I remember questioning someone who'd been accused of corruption and they said, oh no, the allegations against my company are, are historical and they archaeological. And it's like, well, we can only find out about wrongdoing in the past. It doesn't work the other way around. So we're always stuck in that, in that dynamic. And you make a good point about the geo geopolitical situation changing and the nature of our conflicts changing. But the tools are... Uh, the, the trend that we can see over this report and the, the trend of like the public awareness around Menorth Hill is definitely the direction of travel, right? The increasing dependence on intelligence, the increasing use of special forces, the increasing um, use of cyber warfare. Um, and I think, you know, things like drone strikes are so heavily implicated in kind of proxy wars and, and kind of non-state actors and, you know, pseudo-state actors around the world. And that's not going away. I think it's just deepening into that. And I mean, I, I think we didn't set out to try and work out what's going to happen next because that's a that's a deeply uh, difficult thing to do and i leave that to, to the think tanks to, to ponder but i think um it raises the question over whether a base like menworth hill and the strategy that's being pursued in the uk is actually dealing with the real security issues and certainly russia china and um 
terrorism and are real things, uh, whether we're dealing with the symptoms of those uh, wider conflicts or the root causes is in question, whether we're dealing with natural resource competition, whether we're dealing with ideological differences in a constructive way is, is open to question. And we also ignore massive security challenges that often don't get classed as security challenges around things like climate. That somewhere like Menwith does nothing to aid and yet we plough more and more resources into that kind of conflict and that kind of security and ignore all the other things that we know affect us now, whether that be something like climate or something like pandemics, which I think we all probably kind of shrugged off a little bit until two years ago and then suddenly the security threat of something like a pandemic hits home. And so I think not only should we be looking at the role of something like men within our future security, but whether men with is really solving the security problems we have and will continue to have and clearly will have in the decades to come. Can I just add, um, I th no, absolutely, I agree with you um, on that. Um, but also th think of Menwith Hill, it's not a standalone station. It's part of this really global, tight-knit global thing, which is spread around the world. So Menwith, um, the information gathered by Menwith, by the satellites that Menwith uh, <coughs> download from, uh, is mainly focused on North, uh, on Europe, on North Africa, and maybe Russia, to those kind of areas. But there are other places in other parts of the world which are linked into this system, this network, which are focusing on other areas. Uh, and also, of course, it's used for um, communications uh, to some extent as well. Uh, and I think uh, if you look at where the basic, going back to missile defence, if you look at where the missile de defence bases are that the Americans have set up outside their own territory in Europe and in um, Asia, in South Korea, in Japan, you'll see they're kind of actually circling Russia and China in those kind of areas. So this is why one of the reasons why Russia and China are so concerned about those bases is because not only can they fire anti-ballistic missiles, but they can fire missiles too. It doesn't take long to change the into a different type of missile and fire them off into Russian or, or Chinese territory. So there's a lot of concern, a lot of tension being built up and a lot of money being spent. I think um, scientists for global responsibility showed that the, you wouldn't think that GCHQ, for example, would be a big contributor to uh, carbon emissions mm -hmm. in the world. Because th you'd think people sitting at uh, computer terminals, don't, well, they don't use a lot of energy, surely. However, they discovered they were really high energy users or high uh, pr CO2 production um, responsibility because they travel around the world going to conferences <laughs> and I you know maybe they haven't done that in the last year so much but uh, maybe they won't do that in the future when they discover that they can do these conferences online but it shows that there are these hidden things parts of which are not being considered uh, and they can spend billions of dollars on armaments on all of these kind of ways of uh, se secretly trying to get information, etc., etc., but they can't seem to mobilise to ch tackle things like climate change. It's, you know, it's a matter of priorities, really. Just before I take any other questions in the, in the room, and I know we've got at least two, can I ask if there's anybody online who would like to come in with a question? Yeah, well, more of a comment, if I could, uh, Martin. Uh, I just want to, from California, from the United States, recognize and applaud what your group is doing. The seriousness and the commitment level uh, is inspiring. I remember many years ago when uh, I was assigned uh, as an NSA employee at Menlo Hill, several times I passed the, uh, the protests in the rain, in the sun, and didn't know then officer of the uh, NSA for 36 years, what you're doing is very important and I applaud your commitment to education and accountability. Well, thanks for that. I hope everybody could hear it. Um, so thanks, thank you Lee for sharing that. Uh, I think we should now go over, over there. We have a question yeah. and then we'll, then we'll go over to Arthur. 
I mean, I was brought up really near the base, I could see it from my childhood home. And I'm now a journalist, a local news journalist here in Harrogate, and there's still so much like, apathy really about the base, and you hear it a lot, you know, just, just leave them to it really. I mean, how do you explain that considering what we know really that goes on there, just on the doorstep, through reports like this? <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we come across that. When you're campaigning against nuclear weapons, for example, you come across that a lot. And it's because of this, I think, it's because of this feeling, this is a huge kind of machine, this is a huge thing. What can I possibly do to have any effect on this enormous kind of thing that's, that we're facing? Uh, and I understand that. Um, uh, and I, I think all of us understand that. But the, the point is, I guess, you, you've got to do something, you've got to say something. It's so important, as I think has already been expressed, it's so important that individuals do whatever they can to, uh, to show that there is dissent to the way that things are going on, the way that things are happening. Um, and some people also, I think there's a lot of, of course, so much propaganda put out about how important the base is to, for anti-terrorism activities, it's keeping us safe. It's, you know, it's protecting us and all of those kind of things. And they say the same about nuclear weapons too. But uh, when it comes to it, we really have to think closely about what all that means. We have to analyse what we're being told. We have to think about other, op you know, other ways of looking at those things. Uh, and then assess whether you think that what's, you know, whether you think that what we're being told by the authorities is actually true or is actually something that you can actually believe and um, uh, then just act, act accordingly I guess a lot of people have, don't really think about the issues too strongly unfortunately can we, we'll just ask Arthur and then we'll come to you Charlotte oh, sorry sorry and I'll just make one point one question and one plug the point I'd like to make is that I think that sometimes we look at these political and geo things and that you, you, Would you like to come further forward near the microphones? People further away won't hear it. Okay, I'm going to make one point, one question and one plug. The point I'm trying to make is that we sometimes, and the report is extremely useful, but we're looking at the geopolitical uh, situation and the different wars in the Far East, etc., etc., etc. And the point I, but I think that the conflict between Britain and America, the failure to sign the trade deal, leads us to the question that the European Union report, the Eclion report, produced in which Menlith Hill spies on British firms to give information to American firms so that they never get the contract with the British firms. And does that, have you shed any more light on that? Uh, that's, that's the second point. The third is I'm plugging um, the, the, a pamphlet on Stop the War, a snapshot by Andrew Bergen, and I'll give everybody a leaflet at the end. That's it. Um, Thank you. That's a really good question, and it's something I didn't, I didn't have time to cover in the presentation, that we do have a mention in there of the, the evidence that um, spying through GCHQ and, and the NSA certainly has been implicated in um, uh, commercial spying, economic spying. Um, and, you know, uh, I think I mentioned that there was evidence that EU, uh, I think it was the EU Commissioner for Trade or for Business, had been a target at one point, and there have certainly been allegations over the years, this is not only recent, this is long running, that the spying capabilities um, held by the US and the UK are used to uh, give advantage to major trade deals, and I mean, you only have to look at the news in the last few weeks and the massive diplomatic fallout over France not getting a contract to sell nuclear submarines to Australia, which is a private, you know, arms deal, um, and like countries completely falling apart uh, over it, um, to see the, the kind of priority given to those kind of, uh, of arrangements. I'm not familiar with uh, um, the allegations that UK firms were being specifically spied on, but I think the wider point is that we know that this kind of economic spying is used, and that's clearly A, illegal, I think, um, uh, in many cases, and certainly beyond the, the public consent for these kinds of uh, surveillance. And w there should be questions asked over, and if there's allegations that UK firms are being spied on, then they sh 
should be investigated, and I don't think we have confidence that they would be properly. I think that did happen during the Cold War. When, sorry, after the Cold War. Or supposedly the Cold War was finished. I don't think it has, but anyway, um, after the fall of uh, the Soviet Union, I think uh, people thought that maybe Memethil would be used for something else, something different other than military purposes and spying against the Soviets. And um, then it, bec it became emphasised that they were also involved in this commercial activity. And uh, I think it was the Italians in particular who were very concerned, and the French, about losing very large contracts to the United States um, because the United States could get extra information about what their bids were and so on. And in fact, it was, there was an investigation set up in the European Parliament and a number of MPs came over, in fact, MEPs came over uh, uh, to, to see the base and have a look around. Um, unfortunately, uh, what happened next was the 9-11 the uh, and then that, the whole kind of emphasis on the base became terrorism and anti-terrorism and that was forgotten about. The commercial spying was forgotten about. So um, we probably do need to think very carefully about other activities that are going on in the base too. <coughs> I'd like to ask a question, make an observation. Uh, do, uh, would you be kind enough to come near the microphone so that people can hear you? <laughs> I'm sure it's probably loud enough. It's there for the I wanted to ask about the Lynchman idea. Mm -hmm. You're saying that, that I assume what I'm understanding is that members of the data and then they send the information out. Where are they sending it to? Mm -hmm. in, in that is, who has, who's got the drones? And where are the drones based before they send them off to kill the terrorists? The other question I have is, if I look at the audience, I think a few of us are going to see 50 again. And it concerns me, because it's not just this organisation. I think lots of other organisations do with human rights, etc. are losing out because we don't have the own blood coming in to take over from us and to keep the whole idea moving forwards. And I don't know how you get them involved. Um, so as, as far as the, the linchpin idea as you put it so um, this is a phenomenon that I think it's reprieve coined the term of data driven drone strikes right so um, exactly as you say the data from surveillance is fed <coughs> into targeting for drone strikes or other conflicts that can be carried out either through traditional military organisation and structures especially in war zones right so intelligence agencies pass on that information to military units on the ground for them, them to go use, or it, as I, I mentioned in, t in the context of the US, drones are operated by the CIA and special forces as well, and so that's slightly different structures. Where drones are based is obviously quite a secretive question, but we know they're based all around the world. The, UK, uh, the US in particular has a, a global network of bases and one of some of the big things they, they do with those bases is base military aircraft, including drones out of them, including refueling tankers so that um, aircraft can be flown out all around the world to, to make strikes. Um, to be honest, the geography is almost less relevant, right? The, the point of Men With Hill and data-driven drone strikes is that the data is um, global. It just happens that the base is in Men With Hill. Um, and I think the, the, the way in which it has to be accountable, therefore, we have to be even more clever about how that's done and make sure that oversight is even more rigorous because it's not like there's a specific telegram that we can, we can grab and stop and there's some clear chain of command all the time. I think the, the structures are so nebulous and so wide and so secretive that it really takes a lot of effort to get to the bottom of it. Um, and just to, on your comment about, about uh, the, the peace movement and, and so on. I, I, one of the things I think is really interesting about this research is that we've known about the missile defense element of, of Men With Hill for, for decades and CND's you know, consistently looked into it over the years and we've known a bit about the surveillance since like the 1980s and Duncan Campbell, a great investigative journalist, um, exposés. But it's really only in recent years that, that the, the link between these uh, subjects is all coming together. And that opens up to people who are interested in a whole range of subjects beyond just peace movements and anti-arms trade movements, um, people interested in security issues, to also civil liberties, to privacy, 
uh, campaigning, which, which is a whole different constituency, as it were, and is vital that um, that's engaged in campaigning about these issues. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to also emphasise the importance of youth, <laughs> really. Um, y young people are becoming more and more involved in these things, I think. Uh, with nuclear weapons, uh, uh, nuclear weapons have been around for the entire lifetime of many young, most young people. So it's kind of not like, you know, I was born in 1949, so um, nuclear weapons were around then, but they didn't, hadn't escalated to the size that they had become in the height of the Cold War. There was a lot going on in the Cold War. Since the Cold War, the number of nuclear weapons has gone down. People seem to think there's less of a, a problem with things like nuclear weapons because um, the Cold War is over, uh, Russia is no longer seen to be such a threat in terms of nuclear weapons anyway, and there's n nowhere near the same number of nuclear weapons there used to be. However, uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. I mean, it's ex still extremely dangerous that thousands of nuclear weapons are around, ready to be launched at a moment's notice. And if you look at the doomsday clock of the atomic scientists, Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, they put it at 12, uh, 120 seconds, is it, to midnight? The closest it's ever been in the whole of the years that we've had nuclear weapons around. So, young people are becoming more aware of these things. Uh, as you all know, of course, they're very active in climate um, uh, campaigning. And there are connections with, between the militarism and climate. Uh, the military is involved, uh, it actually does contribute more to carbon emissions than, than almost everything else. Uh, with their military exercises, with the construction of the weapons, systems, etc, etc. So they are huge contributors. So there are, the links are there and they're becoming more well known, more widely known and understood. And young people are starting to pay attention to all of those things. The two things, the two things that we face at the moment that threaten our very existence are nuclear weapons and climate change. And they're linked and people know about this. We see governments not doing very much about it. So young people are becoming more involved. Uh, they, I don't think they like to come to meetings, that's all. Um, you can't really blame them so much for that. I did ask both Jeff Dixon, who's the liaison officer at Menworth Hill, to be present with us today. I also asked or sent a letter to Yale Lempert, who is the Chargé d'Affaires acting ambassador for the USA, who hasn't yet replied, but they did get an invitation. We're not trying to do anything in secret. We're trying to be open about our concerns. So uh, I hope that uh, they are listening somewhere. And uh, I'll make sure that we send copies of the report to them. Uh, Hugh, you've got a, got a question. Um, it's a sort of multiplicity of questions because it's. Um, I, I want to ask a question about the, the, the different aspects of which Men with Hill is being used. It's being used for drone strikes, missile defence, and surveillance. Uh, are these? I'm, I'm thinking about how how this is organised within uh, Menwith Hill and within the, um, the the system as to whether these are actually separated. How how much these are separated off? And a question that arises is what's the accountability within the American system? Is 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 Menwith Hill wholly under under the control um, of of uh, America and, and what's the structure within that? Um, to what extent does uh, is uh, does Britain have access to uh, Men with Hill, particularly in terms of its drone strikes and so on and so forth? Do NATO countries have access to that? Does Israel have access to that uh, sort of question? I'm thinking about um, is there likely to be a conflict within the American system of accountability between the two different aspects? Uh, yeah, good, good questions. Um, so, as far as we know, drone strikes are not controlled directly from Menwith Hill. 
Um, those are done from different places, different air bases. I think you know, we, there have been stories over the years of the, the kind of the stereotypical story that's been told and you can read the profiles of is, is of U.S. airmen sitting in an air-conditioned trailer somewhere in Arizona, controlling drones on the other side of the world with an Xbox controller and you know, various creepy things like that. Um, so it's not that those things are all happening from the base. It's largely a surveillance base. This NSA. The National Security Agency seems to be the predominant agency there. We know from questions asked in Parliament that um, US contractors, which is the umbrella term given for basically probably a mixture of private company contractors and intelligence agency officers, probably largely NSA, outnumber UK contractors, which again probably includes GCHQ, and the actual number of military people is, is tiny. I think there's, t uh, according to the last answer we had, which is a year or two ago, there were 10 RAF personnel there, and I think it was about 10 or 20 US military personnel there. So it will sit within the, the hierarchies of the National Security Agency of GCHQ. Now, the legality of it and who controls it, um, bases in the UK are, are agreed, and the jurisdiction over them is agreed under something called the Status of Forces Agreement, which if you want to learn loads about, please go ask Lindis afterwards, because she is probably a great expert on this compared to nearly anyone else I know. Um, but essentially this, this lays out where jurisdiction lies over what happens at the base, including things like traffic accidents as well as the bigger elements as well. There have been revelations, so um, the I, I'm for, the, having a blank of the base at which the Harry Dunn accident at happened. Crowton, Crowton. At Crowton. Um, there was, I think the Times reported after that incident that in theory every US personnel at Crowton had diplomatic immunity. And there were questions over what that diplomatic immunity covered and why it was there and whether it was there as a war on terror thing and what that would potentially cover in the scheme of all the terrible atrocities that happened under the war on terror of torture overseas and all the rest. Um, I still don't think we've got entirely to the bottom of it and where the limits of those diplomatic protections lie, though the Harry Dunn case has kind of clarified it a bit. Um, the question is whether GCHQ and NSA and the military and the US, CIA, etc. are really accountable. In the UK, I would say they're not very accountable. And there's I, I showed you those quotes of parliamentary committees raising questions about the accountability and legality of those systems. I didn't go into it in the presentation, but it's in the report of similar uh, litigation in the US trying to assess the legality of those strikes and the policies that underpin them, uh, which are still very secretive despite groups like the ACLU in the US fighting for years to try and um, get further detail on them. So I think um, there's multiple accountability lines, but I think um, they're all very much in question as to whether they're working or not. I'll just add, uh, just quickly, um, we know that there's a direct fibre optic link between Crowton and um, uh, Djibouti, you know, where the uh, Camp Lamarar, where the US drone base is. So there are these direct communication links between the different types of bases. Uh, Crowton is more of a communications base than, than anything, I think. But still, the, the information gets there from Menwith Hill or from wherever in the world it's being picked up. So uh, these, con these links are there. Uh, we should mention about fibre optics because back in the 70s when the, the satellite kind of boom took, took over and the, the, the satellite dishes multiplied from four originally, I think, to something like 40 now, um, satellites were the main form of communication. But now fibre optics are also very important. Uh, and you can link into fibre optics, you can still hack fiber optic cables and in fact when they come up to the surface uh, from transatlantic or trans um, oceanic uh, sources uh, they are automatically linked into by, by GCHQ or by the NSA. So this happens in Cornwall where transatlantic cables come up to the surface and elsewhere around the world. So uh, all of these communications are <coughs> being monitored, they're being scrutinized, analyzed, and then it goes out through this great network of, of communications to the required 
home? I think, you know, actually the answer to a lot of your questions, we just don't know. <laughs> and we have to kind of surmise to some extent. Okay, Sarah, and then we'll come to Sylvia. I've only got a little thing to say, really. The new um, chief of station at Memory Hill, in fact, was at some stage, I think, head of a joint operations centre between the MSA and the more operational side of the US military and the US allies, right the five eyes, and so that all sort of spreading out. So very aware of the need to communicate all this information. I, I realise we didn't answer your question about who has access to this data, right? Mm. So um, the UK is part of what's called Five Eyes, which is an alliance between uh, the UK, US, Australia, New Zealand, and Dave, help me, Canada. Thank you. Um, <laughs> it's terrible when you put on the spot about these things, even when you thought about them. Um, uh, so the data is, is freely shared between those nations. There are obviously intelligence connections beyond that as well, but that's probably in a more limited sense. Uh, so no, it's not directly linked into, say, Israel, but obviously allies talk to each other and, and information does flow. Uh, I think, Sylvia, you've gone. Um, yes, I think the whole issue is lurking. It's just so mind-boggling. But one thing that I'm beginning to think about is that we, all, we often do advertise the different ba American bases around the world and the connections there. And with the sort of the um, climate change issues and the pandemic, where you know we're not safe until everyone's safe, I think each of us could make some connection with one of the other foreign bases, where we don't like Menlo's Hill and we don't like filing days up on the North York Moors, but in real terms, we're not directly suffering. But all over the world, at these other military bases, people are directly suffering. And I think if we could start to make more of the issues, I know we do it, you know, occasionally and do do it, but that is, is perhaps another way forward. Just, can I just, just ask one little thing? There was the banner saying, um, UK is embedded in the US war plans. And I wanted, to, because I did that before the uh, troubles of, uh, that we had, of leaving Afghanistan and going off where. I wanted to put a question mark. Would you say that the UK is embedded in the US war plans? Uh, it's a really good uh, question. It's a good, simple way of stating it. I think you can argue, yeah. I mean, I think um, uh, you can look to certainly kind of uh, people writing on strategy and security strategy and basically say that the UK has joined at the hip in its security strategy. And certainly we deal in a post-Brexit world of, of um, the EU not being the natural allies and even less than they used to be and the UK, US being the more obvious ally even more than it used to be and then I think when you come to things like nuclear cooperation it, the, the link is deeply um, direct the idea that the UK rents its nuclear missiles from the US is, is kind of mind-boggling when you first discover that one um, and obviously uh, you know the, the arms companies and a lot of the, uh, the wider military industrial complex, if you want to use that term, the wider structures are, are deeply interlinked as well as, you know, beyond that. Um, that doesn't mean that they're completely synonymous and, and the UK is kind of down here and the US is up here as far as things like military spending and, and, and capacity and so on. But, um, yeah, there's certainly a tagging on the coattails perspective and I think there's a reasonable argument that is the case. Yeah, presumably... Um Lots of men were paid to be in the clan, really. Do, do people live there all the time out of interest? So, I mean, you know, presumably it's, you know, it's all... That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I would defer to, to others who've looked at the architectural plans. Um, what we do know is that big new buildings have been built in Menowith Hill in recent years. There was, um, I'm going to forget the number, it's in the report, it was something like a 40,000 square foot data centre was being built at Menowith Hill as of a few years ago. Um, do people live there all the time? I'll, I'll, I'll defer to others who, who yeah, you know, stand outside the bed. I imagine yeah. so, yeah. but yeah. I suspect probably some yeah. live outside as well, but I don't know. They do, yeah. They live on base. Yeah, there's, a, there's like a little town. It's like a small American town. Yeah. 
and in fact, uh, they, all of the stuff you can buy there is American. Uh, and uh, you, I don't know if you can pay in dollars, probably. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can look on Google Maps and see the stars. You can only pay in dollars, okay. And I think Hazel or Lindis will know more. I just want to say that about five years ago, there was about 500 military and contractors went interesting question and the Snowden files give us some insight into this. There's a mixture of the companies kind of opening up back doors intentionally and then being deliberately hacked into by uh, intelligence agencies and so uh, we know that GTHQ was tasked with hacking into I think four of the big companies. Uh, Hotmail was one of them, I forget the others. Um, and so the, the capability is often significantly beyond what these companies would willingly allow. The other thing is that the, the legislation has changed in recent years. So there was the uh, Investigatory Powers Act in 2016, which requires telecoms companies to open up their books to a certain extent to, to the intelligence agencies. But I think even beyond that, the Snowden kind of um, files show that there's kind of capabilities beyond maybe what might have been agreed to. Um, I don't think I mentioned it, but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head whether these were things that have been opened up. But the intelligence agencies gained the ability to you know, switch on your webcam, on your microphone, on your phone, to record your conversations, to record your screen, and record your passwords, and things like this. And I, I, I couldn't say, but in, in, in different cases, some of this may have been allowed, but often it's exploiting um, weaknesses in, in the system set up by tech giants, just like a, a, a hacking organization would. Okay, I think we're going to have to start winding things down. But you haven't asked a question yet. Yeah, we can have a chat over a cup of tea, it's fine. Yeah, my question is, to whom is the NSA accountable? Are they accountable to the US Senate and Congress? Yes, in theory they should be. Um, <laughs> the problem is, again, much like in the UK, a lot of the oversight is conducted in secret, often by relatively few people in government who are often kind of self-selected because they come from security backgrounds and you know might be more likely to be differential. There's still potential for, for politicisation um, when when you go get into these structures. So it's so all a question yeah. of accountability again. Yeah. So this group is asking for accountability of UK Parliament. Can it link up with other groups in the US uh, which can be demanding accountability in the US? Some good question. <laughs> okay. Right, I think we've yeah. probably. Uh, say, Hazel, you Can I just say that um, yeah. because anybody here who isn't on the Men with Hill accountability campaign mailing list, 
We do have a signing up sheet here, so if you'd like to receive newsletters in future, please put your name and contact details on this list. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Okay, I suppose I should finally say, uh, I see Richard Turner and Chris Butler online, as well as Lee. Uh, were there any questions from yourselves? Uh, just saying a shake of the head. I think there's a limit to how long people can concentrate. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Your work starts now. Your homework tonight <laughs> is to read the report, and maybe next week we'll see how much you've learned. <laughs> um, obviously, a big thanks to Barnaby for coming up. Thanks to David. Thanks. <coughs> so, big thanks to Sarah for all the work she did on getting the report into the format you're reading, and somebody called Katie, who did all the desktop publishing, and Patricia Berry for all her work in proofreading. A lot of people have contributed to making sure that report is the quality of the report you're looking at. So many thanks to, to a lot of people for your help so far. The real work starts now. <coughs> <Sorry>. <coughs> Those who've joined us online, we'll be putting everything onto the website of the Men with Hill Accountability Campaign website, and I think other things will go onto the Yorkshire CND website. So look out over the next few days, most of this will go on there. And we need to keep the discussion going, keep thinking, keep asking yourself. Because all of this, Sylvia mentioned it, a lot of this is because people matter. And when people are at risk, just because they're far away, doesn't mean they don't matter. The health and well-being of all the next generations depends on what we're doing. So please keep thinking. And thanks everyone for coming.